For starters, if we think about the, insti the institutional architecture of 18th century money, we learn a lot about credit booms and credit busts. So uh, in the old days, the medieval world, there were problems with money. So it wore out. Com you know, sovereigns competed for money. You could debase it. But there weren't credit booms and busts the way that there are today. So insofar as people think that there were, it's just a myth. There were different problems. Um, it's that 18th century architecture that I mentioned earlier that creates credit booms. So when banks could extend promises on the basis of their decision, their, um, the borrower's promise to be productive and to pay back, um, they're adding to the money supply on the basis of a prediction about the borrower's productivity. And, uh, it's much easier to make a claim that you're going to be productive and to get a banknote than it was to come into the mint with bullion and get a coin because you need the bullion up front. So part of the magic of the sort of modern economic moment was this ability to extend liquidity on the basis of a promise that you would pay back because you'd have the banknotes, you'd go out, you'd use them for some productive activity and then you'd pay back the bank, right? It's a much more, it's a virtuous cycle, right, of repayment. And it's unique to the modern moment. The problem is that in good economic times, many people's promises of productivity seem plausible. They seem like a good bet for a bank. And so if you have many commercial banks, and for that matter, if you have the Bank of England, accepting these predictions of productivity and extending banknotes, then you have lots of, of money going into circulation. And it's possible under those circumstances that you'd have lots of money going into circulation and, and lots of it going into economic activity so that you wouldn't see prices rise necessarily. But in particular sectors, in particular asset classes, um, in particular industries, there could be over-investment, right? By virtue of the monetary system itself, you're feeding what seem to be promising sectors of society. Um, but for many reasons, that uh, f for many re uh, reasons, um, including unwise bank lending in times, you know, banks are competing with each other and they're making, they're extending these promises <laughs> um, because especially in good economic times, they seem like a good bet. You get the overextension of credit in those cases. Um, and, uh, and many uh, events could destabilize the, um, the money supply in that kind of situation. Either it turns out uh, borrowers are not able to repay promises, or there might be an external shock from outside, um, outside of an industry that hampers the productivity of an industry. If borrowers aren't able to repay, they can't, uh, they can't repay the bank. Other de uh, depositors to the bank may become worried that the bank doesn't have the money because of um, the failure of borrowers to repay, so they begin to withdraw their deposits. So just as you had monetary, ex you had expansion as a monetary matter on the way up, you can have a collapse as a monetary matter occur that brings the whole system down, and that's a bust. So the booms and busts of the modern era are in many respects monetary phenomena. Um, and the last thing I'll say there, I mean, we so we we understand and we work out how bank how bank panics happen, how bank runs and eventually system-wide panics happen. But we haven't connected them sufficiently to the, to the monetary system themselves, to, the, to money creation. And um, uh, there are many ways to draw an analogy between the banking system and the shadow banking system. So the, the set of economic actors, big investment banks who operate um, on top of commercial banking and using commercial banking for their credit lines, in many ways they're reproducing uh, money creation by virtue of the way that they uh, extend credit and the kinds of credit forms they extend. So they extend very short-term credit that can be turned over nightly and they lend longer term into security markets. And that's the same structure that's so unstable at the commercial banking level. So the very structure of the shadow banking sector, which is to lend long term into an industry and, and to, um, to lend on the basis of these short term credit instruments, 
like repo and asset-based um, commercial paper, these names that you hear from the financial crisis, the structure is basically replicating a commercial banking structure. Uh, and it's vulnerable to the same kind of monetary collapse that the commercial banking structure is.